Good evening, everyone. I'm a grateful Christian who struggles with alcoholism. My name is Ruben, and today I choose recovery. Good evening, guys. Tonight I'm tasked to share a bit of my story in the hopes that it might bring to light where I once was in addiction and by God's grace where I am today in recovery. First, let's ask for God's blessing through prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this opportunity to serve you through testimony. May it be your words that flow through my mouth so that it will reach the hearts of those who need a touch from you. You are the potter and I am the clay. Mold me, shape me, use me in a mighty way. And it's the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Amen. If my story has a title, then that title would simply be Change. I was born January 1961. As soon as it was physically possible, my paternal grandparents took me to raise as their own. Yeah, I was spoiled. My grandfather was a Spanish Pentecostal preacher with a small church in Newark, New Jersey. They didn't have a lot to offer monetarily, but their love for me knew no bounds. To this day, I can remember most of those times with them, mostly in the church. The first change in my life came when I was six years old, and the state of New Jersey said that since my parents live in Brooklyn, New York, they let the state of New York pay for my public education. I had to leave the safety and comfort of my grandparents' home and start a new life with my unsaved parents. My parents were hardworking people who spent most of their adult life working in the garment industry. That's a fancy way of saying they were factory workers. Even at an early age, they had me working weekends and summers right alongside them. My father, in order to supplement the family income, ran an after-hour social club. Now that is also a fancy way of saying that he ran a bar opened only at night. And as the song says, the freaks come out at night. The neighborhood that I grew up in was a mixture of Italians and Puerto Ricans, which means that the mob and the local street gangs ruled the hood. My father was what they called a good fella. He had an in with both the mobsters and the gangs. He just wasn't all the way in, if you know what I mean. Every liquor store, supermarket, corner bodega knew that if I walked in to buy booze, beer, or smokes, I was buying for my dad. No questions asked. Besides, that was the late 60s and 70s. There was no for asking for IDs, and everybody in the neighborhood knew who everyone was. This power would soon make me a very popular boy in the streets. Let's fast forward to the late 70s. I'm a teenager with disco fever and a lifestyle to match. I was going to high school, working part-time at the factory still with my parents, and partying every opportunity that I can get. My home life was a different story. Excuse my French, but it sucked. I had no relationship with my sister. My father and I were constantly fighting about the type of life I was leading, even though it was the same type of life that he emulated to us, and my poor mom stuck in the middle. They were trying to set ground rules so late in the game that they could not make them stick. I needed a change. So one day while I'm catching a buzz with a few of my friends, all of us complaining about life, one of them says, dude, I hear the Marine Corps is accepting applicants without diplomas. And in my cloudy state of mind, I said, dude, what a great idea. <laughs> so the next day, I went to the local Marine recruiter. And one month prior to graduating from high school, I left for the Marine Corps. Now talk about change. Those three years in the Marine Corps had a profound impact on me. I went from a punk teen to a young man. I was able to see the world. I learned a new trade, 
But the partying continued. Only the location changed. Before I knew it, those three years came and went. Now it's back where it all started, Brooklyn, New York. We're in the early 80s now. Ronald Reagan is president of the United States. The economy is good, and I get a job on Wall Street. Let me tell you, the partying just cranked up another notch. In those days, it was almost a job requirement. One bright spot in all this darkness is that God had a plan for me. And it all started when he brought my wife, Miggy, into my life. Genesis 2.18, then the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is right for him. She was what I needed to change the path that I was on. And after 33 years of marriage, she's still my barometer. We knew that New York was not the place we wanted to raise a family. Miggy had left and moved back to Fort Myers, Florida, where she originally came from. So in March of 86, I left everything that I knew and I moved to Fort Myers. A new career, a marriage, getting pregnant, in that order, by the way, all before the new year. That was a lot to take in in such a short period. There were good times, there were bad times, but we were able to roll with the flow. And after a few years of struggling to establish a good life here, I get the dream job with the fire department. Our second boy is born, and we're active in our church and we're living the American dream. But the drinking continues. Now I'm just doing it on the down low. It wasn't until these past few years that my drinking went from small problem to outright abuse. I was nearing my eligibility for retirement and all the experiences, the traumas, the deaths, all that I had been exposed to was affecting my mental well-being. The fire department, we didn't believe in sharing our feelings or pains. That wasn't the macho thing to do. So I drank to drown out the thoughts and feelings of pain while I was awake and dealt with the nightmares when asleep. It got to the point where I drank to be able to go to work. It didn't take long before the fire department caught on to what was going on, and they really didn't take too kindly to it. Long story short, I chose early retirement rather than being fired and lose everything that I had worked hard for. Well, wouldn't you know it, it would still take two more years of doing the same thing over and over before I finally realized that I had to change. My wife was at her wit's end. My children didn't want nothing to do with me. And I pretty much wanted to end my life. It was around this time that someone from our church mentioned celebrate recovery at Grace Church to my wife. That's how long ago it was. Trust me, she was ready to ship me off to a one-year program that our church friends had connections with. But they didn't think it was a good fit for me, and I didn't want to go there. So Celebrate Recovery sounded like the better of two evils. I can say now, good choice, because my life had changed the night that I walked into that service. I can say now, oops, sorry. We came to a Monday night meeting, and I tell you, when we say that the initial greeting is crucial for all the first timers, well, I'm living proof of it. My now friend and mentor, Tom Kay, was the first person to greet me. So was a very pregnant Rochelle. With warm greetings, friendly smiles, they made it easy to be there. I was so pumped up that when I finally got to meet Pastor Arlene, 
I almost crushed her hand while trying to shake it. It didn't take long before I finally realized that this was what I needed in my life, and I jumped in with both feet into my personal recovery. Tom Kay introduced me to what is now my traditional meeting home group, as well as to my past and present sponsor. I became an active participant in the big and small groups, which has helped me to meet new and wonderful people who are walking the same path as I am, and I even started doing a little service work. The most important thing that happened during this time of change and growth is how my desire to get closer to God grew with my desire to stay sober day to day. It's not like there wasn't many challenges along the way. I hadn't even earned my 30-day coin when my wife had surgery that caused her to be bedridden for nine months bringing her close to death a few times. I became a caretaker and nurse, yet God provided the strength and grace to be strong for her and still continue my daily recovery. No sooner that she was somewhat back to normal, and both my parents ended up in the hospital at the same time, and they had to be put into long-term long -term health care. Now, I was the one that had to handle all these things that came with parents being cared for rather than being the caretakers, and that was a daunting task. I would joke that 2018 was a bad year for me to quit drinking, but 2019 soon became worse, and I eventually lost both of them within months of each other. In hindsight, I now realize that I was able to do and use what I learned about the 12 steps to help me through this season of life. Steps one, two, and three, I learned that I had no longer control over these issues in my life, and even though I thought I could handle anything that was thrown my way, this was way out of my control. I had to understand that I needed help to keep me focused on the situation at hand. No matter how much training I've had or life experiences I've been through, I realized that I couldn't do this by myself. I had to let go and let God be the one who was running the show. Understand one thing, this, wasn't, this doesn't mean that you just give up and say, okay God, it's your turn. This means that you are no longer in charge. You are giving control of your will and your life to his care, period. Step four, five, and six, I had to do some serious checkup from the neck up. There were a lot of negative thoughts and actions going on in my life that were hindering me from focusing not only on my recovery, but also on my life. I had to figure out what they were put them down on paper, and accept them for what they were. I was able to share these thoughts with a few trusted people. I understand one thing. This is not an easy thing for me to do. It's not in my DNA. You know the type. Strong, proud, Puerto Rican. There was a lot of professional counseling during that time, which helped me put my life into focus. All this led me to a point where I could turn all those negative thoughts and actions over to God and have them removed from my life. I took solace in the words of Jesus found in Matthew 18, 28, 30. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Step seven, eight, and nine, I had to do some soul searching. I had to clean out the closet of all those stumbling blocks, negative attitudes, and prejudices that kept me from his good grace. 
I also had to let those whom I was caring for know that even though I was doing my best to be there for them, I wasn't perfect. There were moments when it became overwhelming for me and my thoughts and actions would show how burnt out I was getting. It wasn't their fault that all this was happening, and now I had to assure them that no matter what, I was there for them. Now in steps 10, 11, 12, something that I still do every day, I had to keep myself in check. If I mess up, fess up. Sometimes there's a speck in my eye. Sometimes it's a whole two by four. Either way, figure it out and fix it. I would pray for his guidance, ask for his direction, and seek his permission. Then I would wait for his response. If a response was forthcoming, and even if his answer was no. The most important thing I learned to do at this time was to make sure that I followed through with what I received from him. It was during this time of prayer and meditation that God assured me that my wife would overcome her health issues and that even though both my parents would pass on, their, their place in heaven was prepared. The lesson learned is that I can take this tragedy and turn it into testimony. To be there for anyone who may be going through something like I did with direction, advice, or a shoulder to lean on would be a blessing to me as much as it might be for that person in need. Another thing that was and still is a big blessing for me during this situation was my service work. Some people might have said, don't you have enough on your plate? But I didn't see it that way. Nothing will help a person temporarily forget their situation more than doing something for others, and that was the case for me. I first started out by helping anywhere I could, but I love to cook. And I love to see people enjoying what they're eating. I did it for 25 years at the fire department. So when they needed help in the kitchen on Monday nights, I found my place to serve. It went from assisting to eventually running the kitchen, even while I continued to deal with the situations at home. It gave me peace, even with all the craziness that came with cooking for 100 plus people. I'm also a member of the prison ministry team whoop, whoop, that was started in February of 2019, as well as a member of the CR's operation team. And I would fill in as facilitator for his men's small groups. It doesn't matter where a person is, or should I say, it doesn't matter where a person serves. It's just, it just matters that we serve. Like we say around here when we read the five essentials, service work, do it. And with that, I will end my public service announcement on service work. As for the bad time to quit drinking comment that I mentioned earlier, a smart lady I know told me that, I was the, it, that it was the right time because I was there for the people that needed me the most with a clear mind. Thank you, smart lady. I have learned to lean heavily on God's word, the 12 steps and the five essentials to keep me on my path of recovery. As I close, I want to first give give God all the glory for without him, I would not be standing here or I probably wouldn't be standing anywhere. To my lovely bride, My two boys, I give my love and thanks for being there for me and never giving up. Thank you. To my brothers and sisters who are walking this path we call recovery, I leave you this favorite scripture of redemption. It's found in Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, Messiah's Jubilee. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, 
because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion and to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous trees, planted by the Lord to glorify him. Thank you for this opportunity to share. God bless you. Good night. Peace.